Hello, I'm Greg Pollock, and you're watching the ninth episode of the Scaling Rails screencast series, supported by New Relic. If you have a Rails app in production right now, do you know what the throughput was for it for the last 30 minutes? Do you know where the slowest controller actions are, and what you need to do to scale the app a little bit better? Well, if you don't, I highly recommend you take the time to install New Relic's RPM performance monitoring service. In this episode, we're going to be focusing on client-side caching. So in the previous few episodes, we've been primarily focusing on the cache that goes on on the server side of your application. Now we're going to be talking a little bit more about the caching on the client browser side, because there's actually ways that you can control that cache. There's three different ways we're going to be talking about. First of all, you've got the max age header, then you've got the e-tag header, and lastly, the last modified header. Starting up with max age, in order to set that header in Rails, all we need to do inside one of our controller actions is simply add expires in 10 minutes, or one hour, or one day. And what this does is it sets the header max age 600. What this tells the client's browser is that the content that I'm sending you is valid for the next 600 seconds. So if the user clicks off the page, clicks back onto the page, within that 10 minutes, simply load what you have in your cache. However, what I've seen with most browsers is that if a user presses the refresh button, it is going to do a round trip to the server every time and ignore the max age header. Next, we're going to be talking about e-tags. And it turns out, by default, Rails actually takes advantage of e-tags. Your application may be using it. You may not even know it. The functionality looks something like this, where a client requests a certain URL. The Rails server is going to render out the whole body like it normally does. And it then, by default, creates an e-tag. What is that e-tag? Well, it basically takes the entire body, which is just rendered, and translates that into an MD5 hash. It then sends back that MD5 hash with the body back to the client browser. The client browser is going to cache the page along with the e-tag. Then the next time that user clicks back to that page, it's going to send that request again. It's also going to send the e-tag back in this header you see here. Um, don't worry about remembering that. That's simply the header that it uses to send back the e-tag. The server is going to render the body again. It's going to render out the entire body. It's going to create an e-tag. It's then going to compare the e-tag between the one that it just created and the one that got sent over by the client. If it does match, then it's going to clear out the body and send back the header 304 not modified. That tells the client that what it has in its local cache is valid, and it will load it up. So the benefit of using e-tags in this way is that it's faster page loading for the client, because it's loading everything up out of its local cache. However, as you might have noticed, it's still the same speed for the server, because every time the server has to render out the complete page to calculate the e-tag to see if it matches. If we had to define what an e-tag is in simple terms, it might be a key that we use to see if the page is the same. Now, by default in Rails, we basically take the entire body of the page to calculate that e-tag. However, in Rails 2.2, we've been given the ability to create a custom e-tag for our Rails apps. What might we use for a custom key? Well, a good example of this might be the cache key on a certain model, if that page you know, is just showing information about that specific model. So let's take a look at what that might look like. So here we are in our users controller. We're looking at the user show method, where we get the user out of the database. What we might do here is call if stale etag user. This line does a couple different things. First of all, what it's going to do, it's going to call cache key on the user object. And as we saw before, this is basically the uh, table name, then the ID, then the updated at field. The second thing that this piece of code is going to do is it's going to check the e-tag that the client browser sent in against the current e-tag of that user object. Right? So it's going to see if it matches. If it does match, it's going to send back head not modified and not even bother rendering out um, what's in this if statement or what might be in the view. However, if it doesn't match, it's going to run those extra queries and do whatever rendering we need to do. Another way we can write this is by using the fresh when function. The only difference here is that the syntax is a little bit different, and we are not able to do that if statement that we can do with stale. So using this type of e-tag, our customized e-tag, there's no rendering or the view or any additional queries inside that conditional, and things get even faster. However, what would we do if our web page depends on two different models, let's say user and company? 
Well, then we would just send in both of those into an array, and it would use both of those active record objects to create an e-tag. So now we're going to take a look at last modified, which works very similar to e-tags. So here we've got a client browser in our server. The client does a request. On the server side, we might have some code that looks something like this. So here we're checking to see if the last modified is stale or not. So basically, last modified, as you can see here, is just a date, and we're setting that to the user updated at date. So the server is going to render the body. It's going to send back the body with the last modified date to the client browser, which caches the page, also caches the last modified header. Then the next time the user sends in that request, it's going to send back the last modified date in the HTTP if modified since header. You don't need to remember that again. The server is then going to check to see if the date the user sent in matches what it has locally. If it does, then it's going to simply send back 304 not modified, not send back any of the body, and the client's going to render the cache page. Just like with e-tags, we can also use the fresh when command. So we do fresh when last modified user dot updated at. It's also worth mentioning that you can use both e-tags and last modified at the same time. When might you want to do that? Maybe, maybe you have something like this, where a web page depends on both the post user object and maybe some external RSS feed. So now that you know how to do some of this client-side caching, let's make sure it's clear you know when to do it. First of all, you want to do it after you've used fragment or object caching and you've used increased throughput. So after you've cached as much as you can out of your application using the previous methods and you want even more throughput, save yourself CPU time, um, you should do it. It's going to give you improved server performance because it's reducing the number of queries you have to do and the renders you have to do. And your clients are actually going to see improved client performance because it's going to be using the client cache on their browser more often. A few months ago, 37signals implemented e-tags on their Basecamp application. What they found is that it increased response time for their users, it decreased CPU load, and it also decreased database load. So take a look at their article if you want to see an example of this in use. That about sums it up for this episode. Now that you're familiar with client-side caching, though, we can venture into the realm of reverse proxy caching or using a gateway cache. These are the tools the big boys use to scale with Rails. It's really easy, so definitely check out this next episode. Thanks for watching.